Hi everyone and um, thanks again Helen for that incredible presentation. It's very exciting to see um, what Infrastructure Australia have been doing and um, we look forward to, to seeing the, uh, the launch of the plan. We're now going to uh, move into our next session where we start to have some presentations as we've done with our uh, last two uh, symposium days. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to briefly speak about NGAA's research uh, partner, and that's the Life Course Centre, or its full name is the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for Children and Families Across the Life Course. Um, the Life Course Centre is a national research centre and, and it's investigating the ways in which deep and persistent um, disadvantage endures within families and in communities. Um, we've been very fortunate to have Life Course Centre as a partner for this um, symposium um, because it, uh, the Life Course Centre manages an academic network across the universities of Queensland, Western Australia, Melbourne and Sydney and also works with international academic partners and with other partners like the NGAA. Um, the aim of the centre is to um, generate evidence-based research, which NGA is a big fan of, to develop new knowledge, technology and practices to benefit those living in or at risk of disadvantage. Uh, so I'd encourage you all to look at their website. Um, the web address uh, is on the screen uh, and really engage with uh, some of the research that the academics of the Life Course Centre um, are producing. It's, it's really quite extraordinary. Um, so as I mentioned, we're fortunate actually to have some of these academics participate in our symposium and they've been part of the whole, all of the three days. Today we have joining us Sangeetha Chandrashekaran. Um, I'll introduce uh, um, uh, Sangeetha at the start of the panel, uh, but a very special welcome to you Sangeetha and thank you for your participation in today's symposium. Um, so to start our next session, uh, I'll give a bit of an overview. And local infrastructure demand seems to get bigger and bigger and growth area councils are responsible for delivering a challenging scale of infrastructure and many of you will, will know that, you live it and breathe it. Councils have limited resources to manage contracts and are frequently overlooked by other levels of government delivering their own programs and we, we sort of alluded to that just with the discussion with Helen just now. Um, there's any number of surprise announcements, uh, particularly in the lead up to elections. And um, again, there's investigations into that now as well. Uh, so basically in such a complex operating environment, innovation in sustainable asset planning, delivery and management is key. Our speakers today are showcasing doing infrastructure differently and uh, we're really pleased to have them uh, and they'll bring different perspectives uh, from a council perspective and also uh, from a, another agency perspective. So our first presentation in this session is from Trevor Griffin and Trevor is the manager design and construction at the city of Casey and I'll say he's a former colleague and a lovely guy. Casey is a very large growth council in the outer southeast of Melbourne and in fact has been a growth area for well over 30 years with a lot more growth to come as well. Trevor is presenting today on a model of innovative procurement and his presentation is titled Bundled Recreation Reserves for Community Value. Welcome Trevor and um, I invite you to start your presentation. Thanks Nicola. All right, I'll get started. As Nicola, uh, said in her introduction, my name is Trevor Griffin, I'm the manager of City Design and Construction. Before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge that the City of Casey proudly acknowledges the tr traditional owners, the Bunurong and Wurundjeri people, and their rich culture and pays respect to their elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge the traditional owners as Australia's first peoples and as the owners and custodians of the land on which we work and live. My presentation is entitled Bundled Recreation Reserves for Ma Maximum Community Value. And I can't get the screen to, oh, sorry. Um, yeah, Nicole has already probably given a, a very good uh, background to Casey. I won't go over it again. It's a southeastern municipality. Uh, it's the biggest by population in Victoria, planning to grow to 550,000 in the next 20 years. And we have on average about 100 babies born per week. So we have a very uh, large young cohort um, in the municipality. Our capital works budget is just on $150 million a year, of which 
uh, the, the department that I work in has a large part of delivering. Um, in terms of the challenge that we were presented to us was that uh, normally we would build on average one new recreation reserve a year, and we would take somewhere between two and three years to complete that, that one recreation reserve. The challenge that we were presented was that um, coming along in the budget, we had to start four new recreation reserves in year one, and there was another four coming in the subsequent two years after that. In terms of the aerial photograph we've got there, that shows the locations. Um, some of them were probably past the, uh, were still in the undeveloped area of the municipality. Some was right on the, on the growth boundary in terms of physically people were moving in. And we had a couple of others where the growth front had actually moved past um, where the recreation reserves were going, but they're all situated in the growth area section of the council in the southeast corner of the municipality. Um, I'll just briefly describe what I mean by a recreation reserve. In this instance, it was like a double playing field, pavilion, AFL cricket or soccer, car parking, landscaping. Pretty much it was paddock to play, as we call it. Everything um, as part of this project had to be built. There was just grass there at the moment. So sports lighting, car parks, recycled water, playgrounds and um, public art. In terms of how we used to do it, I'll paraphrase that as being careful. We would let a contract for the civil works and it's listed there. We'd finish that. There'd be a little bit of a delay. We would have let the contract for the building works, but the builder didn't want to start on site until the civil contractor had left. So that, as I said, there'd be a delay and that would continue on through the building contract, through the landscape contract, and then finally the playground and public art component. We always built them within budget. Um, because we could modify subsequent contracts if the initial contracts went over. And unfortunately, that always nearly meant that the landscape component got uh, cut. Um, we thought we got a good quality, but because of that delay between contracts and the letting of contracts and the startups, you know, it was taking up to three years to finish one of these. And with four coming in one year and another four coming in quick after that, um, we just didn't think that the model that we had, whilst we thought it was pretty good, it, it wasn't going to be able to cope with that wave of work that was coming. So we acknowledged that we were going to have a problem. And probably the main message that in terms of responding to that is we went and got some expert advice from project management consultants in terms of we went to them and said, this is what this is the task that we have at hand. What sort of packaging up of the contract would you recommend? What's the market for this out there? Um, we went and spoke to our lawyers and we got a lot of good advice about transferring risk onto the contractors up until then, council had borne all the risk pretty much. Um, we wanted to reduce procurement time. We wanted to build in some price certainty. We wanted to build confidence out in the market that what we were putting out for them to bid on was you know, good quality work and was something that they wanted to get involved with. And also to build confidence within the organisation that what we were doing, it was a different to what we normally did, but it was it was being done in a thorough way. And that there was also the potential for ongoing work, whether that was going to be attractive to the market. Then we went back to the market and asked them, this is before tendering, we you know just what do you reckon? What could we tweak? What could we pull out? What could we put back in? But probably the biggest um, time and effort was taken in trying to convince the people within the organisation that had delivered quite successfully under the old method, why we needed to change and what were the advantages of changing and what were the disadvantages of staying the way we were, that it actually provided them with an opportunity to change their role. Um, and it was actually good for their careers that if you're going to be managing the bigger contracts that I'm about to speak about, it's actually great for your career that you could start to look outside local government because of the work that you were doing. So we sort of came up with two main approaches. The first one was that we would bundle all the, all the different contracts as the way we used to do it into one big contract. And on average, they were about $12.5 million per site. It varied. We, we had a triple sports ground site and we had a single, but on average, they were two, so about 12.5 million. We put all the delivery risk and time onto the contractor and we locked in a time that they had to be finished by. The only thing that we didn't put in the contract was um, 
playground and public art. We were a little bit nervous about doing that. We thought that that was probably a little bit hard to specify in a contract. So we left them out. In terms of value, it's quite low relative to the, to the main work. But that was the first decision we made. And at that stage, we were gonna go out with eight different contracts. But we reflected on that and thought that actually we're, we're putting out into the market $100 million worth of work. And there must be some advantages in going to the market, indicating that, that there was that amount of work there. So what we did, we packaged up the first four rec reserves that we did have funding for. We put them out, and we also, but we also listed the other four that were coming subject to funding and, and at council's discretion. So the tender went out and we awarded to the first four to two companies. They got two contracts each. And then because of the pandemic funding, we got a lot of extra money very quickly. So we then fast tracked the design of the next four. They were actually out for pricing before we'd finished the first four. Um, but the, the, the two companies that won the contracts, they then bid on the, that next package of four. And the first contractor won two, and then the other contractor won the subsequent two. The subsequent contractor sharpened their pencil because they didn't win the first. So we use competition amongst those two contractors to drive down the price or keep the price uh, cost effective. And we didn't have to go out to public tender for the second batch of four because we do, the contract was structured so that it effectively covered the eight sites in the initial contract. We proposed fixed rates that we were going to use in the second batch of four, which ultimately didn't work. And I'll talk about that in a bit more. But we decided that, as I said, with that amount of value of work, that we should use that to our advantage. So fast forwarding in terms of results, we've now finished four of the recreation reserves. We've got the other four that are under construction. They'll be finished in, all the eight will be finished this time next year, which will be about two and three quarter years. We got delayed a little bit with COVID. Uh, construction still continued in Victoria or Melbourne when we had the um, lockdown last year, but it reduced, it was down to 25% of normal um, on-site numbers and it, it got down to, I think, 10 individuals at one point in time. So what, what that has meant is that we've been able to build just over $100 million of new community facilities for the community to enjoy. And that's one of the, um, one of the sites there. We actually think we've had a quality improvement by doing it this way, primarily because we've had one contractor responsible for delivery whereas previously we had multiple contractors on the same site. And the contractor, if there was some issues in terms of the different designs, because we had consultants, a landscape consultant, a civil consultant and a building consultant, if all the designs didn't stitch together well and there was level differences or different materials specified, the one contractor in charge would make sure that it, it was resolved and it was resolved quickly. And, and with a good quality outcome. So we've actually think we've got an improvement in quality. They've been completed within budget. The, the budgets were all based around this, doing it the old way. So we haven't had price gouging by the higher tier contractors, which we were afraid of. Um, we did have some contingency, which we've had to use, but they've never been unreasonable. We've been able to meet our pandemic stimulus funding timelines because we were confident when we applied for the money that we had contractors that could gear up quickly and get on with it and we didn't and we had some a few months saving in time in terms of not going at the public tender and overall we think we've reduced the risk to council because we've been able to do it on budget within our timelines and with limited variations we did not end up actually enforcing the fixed rates because prices were going up um, in construction whilst we were building and also the designs they weren't all the same the sites were different we had different consultants in the rush to get the second batch of four out. Um, they were designing some standard features that were different to the first four. So um, we didn't actually enforce the fixed rates, but we knew through those rates um, whether we were getting competitive prices back from the contractors. We think we've saved on council contract and project management because we haven't had so many staff looking after so many little contracts because we would have had five or six contracts times eight to manage, whereas here we've had eight. Obviously they're bigger and larger and more complex, but we think overall we've saved on um, those two aspects. And the ironic thing is that um, we had the head contractor finishing the work and then we couldn't get the playground contractors or the public art 
installers on site when we wanted them. So some of the ribbon cutting events got delayed because they weren't finished. It had nothing to do with the head contractor. It was just because we kept those being run by council at times, they actually delayed the opening. Um, the other thing was that we, we did have a lot of design issues in the second batch because we had to put them together so quickly to meet the funding timelines, but the head contractor was able to work through those in a reasonable manner to deal with them. And because, yeah, because they were put out with such a rush, we didn't have time to actually review uh, what was the good and bad about the first batch of four, because we were already, we were still constructing the first batch whilst we were tendering the next batch. So ideally we would have had a bit of time in between the, first, the two batches of four, but we didn't, so um, we didn't. We weren't able to learn all our lessons from the first batch to the second. But overall, um, you know, much less stress. I've got a whole lot of other projects that I worry about. I don't lose sleep over these projects because I know they're going to be delivered on time, on budget, and suitable quality. I suppose the lessons um, that I'd like to share out of our experience on this that is that if you can make your packaging attractive to the market with some incentives of an additional work, it really drives their innovation and their ability to come together and put together a, a high quality group of head contractor and subcontractors. It does require an uplift in council pro project management skills and risk appetite. Um, I had a lot of support for what we were planning to do from the executive, but probably the area of greatest um, disagreement, I suppose, initially, or scepticism was uh, within the departments that were delivering the projects because they were quite comfortable and didn't quite see the need for change. So they thought it was a very risky um, thing to do, that we were you know, going to spend $100 million and get terrible results, or that we were going to, as I said, get gouged by more sophisticated, uh, more savvy contractors compared to our sort of local contractors, which we use for the smaller contracts on each of the sites. I suppose the biggest lesson would be that if you know that um, your growth rate is going to increase and you've got a wave of work coming, you need to find the time to see if your delivery model matches the growth that is coming. Um, we think we've done pretty well in this area, but we've got other parts of uh, capital that we deliver that we haven't quite got there and we need to reflect on that. But if you can find the time and if you know your growth is going to increase, you've got to check to see whether your current delivery model from infrastructure actually will we'll be able to match the growth that's required living in and working in a growth municipality. Um, and just finally, just a couple of photos of works that are currently underway in terms of that second batch of four. Uh, one is taken by one of the engineers who illegally flies his drone. And the other one is the project manager for all the eight sites who's just got his pilot's license. So he was busy taking photos by himself I'm not sure how he was flying the plane when he took that photo, but um, yeah, they're the ones that are currently under construction. And thank you, that's that's me, done. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. <laughs> Thanks, Trevor. Um, amazing to see, um, yeah, just the rate of those uh, of delivery. So Trevor will join us uh, in the panel after a little later on this afternoon. Uh, if you have any questions of him, you're welcome to put them in the Q&A uh, now or you can um, you know, put them on hold for a little while and then um, have them ready for when we have the panel session. But thank you very much, Trevor. It was uh, really great and I love the aerials. Fantastic.